Listen, Nelson, when you first came to Prison, I guess what I'm trying to say is Prison is not what Prison used to be, I guess, when you first came. No, it ain't. But this is crazy. This is crazy, how Man, these boys so disrespectful. People don't care no more. It's never like that. I see why you stay on the bed and out the way so nobody won't hurt you. I'll just chop one of them in the head, though. I'll come down with these bad thighs like this foot. Mr. Nip, but you're a little too old to be trying to get violent now. I ain't got violent on my head, huh? I'm going to stick with the top of the guy's head. That's fucking crazy. No, no, we ain't going to, but I'm not going to promote all that, Mr. I don't want to see you hurt nobody. I'm going to survive. I understand. I ain't got time to make with them children. But they're younger than you, though, Mr. Nip. That's what I'm saying. I'm going to survive. I'm going to survive. I'm about 81 years. You know who's about to die in 20 more years before I die out. I understand that. Because you ain't yeah, you yeah, ain't yeah. reached 81 for nothing. I understand yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Alabama Prisoner Profiles. What going on with y'all, man? Make sure y'all continue to like, subscribe, leave a comment, share the content, send a super thanks in the comment section. That's that little heart with a dollar sign in it right up under the description. Make sure y'all continue to bless the Cash App and the PayPal dollar sign Bama Prison Files. So, y'all, I got the PayPal back working. I didn't know it wasn't working until somebody reached out to me and let me know that they couldn't find it when they looked it up and I had to go into the security privacy settings and make it to where it was searchable for the uh, out of the country folks that could find it and that brings me to the first housekeeping bullet point of the day shout out to that girl Tessa for the first PayPal donation shawty sent the 50 ball you know what I'm saying and pause why the first donation coming from out the country what's going on you filthy americans like what's going on with y'all man crabs in a bucket man crabs in a bucket you know what i also think i've also never seen she said she's been watching for months and i've never seen her in the comments telling me what the hell i need to do with this and that and whoop de bam but if you got some ideas shawty hey <laughs> i definitely am up to listen to them now you know what i'm saying we got that. It got my attention. Other than you know, mama was attacking me personally in the comment section. Then you got to go make another YouTube, you know. So shout out to her and shout it straight to her. Like, damn, I need to be sending this to Shawty. I may need to, you know, what I'm saying, learn how to snowboard or ski or something. Going out to Finland, live happily ever every day. What I'm talking. Next, if you're from Alabama, you have no excuse to not be supporting this. So I really don't want to have to get on that with people from Alabama. So y'all, please, you know what I'm saying? Next question for these out of state. Are y'all state's administration getting jammed left? Like we have at least two to three a month here. They're getting caught with the work cell phones. You know what I'm saying? Using their position for personal games. And how are y'all keeping up? Like, does the Renews report this out there? Do y'all's corrections programs report this stuff to the news or try to sweep it up under the rug? You know what I'm saying? Y'all let me know about that in the comment section for y'all state, right? People are making the Daniel Williams the ATL thing a race issue. It's like it's not, but it isn't. But I'll tell you this. I reached out to that boy, throwing away. Y'all remember the 40-minute interview with dude who wanted me to uh, disguise his voice. If y'all hadn't seen that, go check that out. Dude did 40 years, right? And I've asked him, I'm like, so are there any, like, <clears throat> white predators in there at all? Have you ever seen any? He's like, nope. I'm like, so in your 40 years in Alabama Zoom, you've never seen a white person, like a white dude, be on that ATL grapey creep shit he said not at all i said god damn well shit i mean well there you go y'all do with that what you will next do mods sift through the comment section 
Anybody interested in being one of those? Uh, let me know about that. Um, YouTube doesn't show me every single comment, but I see most of them. You know what I'm saying? We ain't got 100,000, 50,000, 30,000, 20,000 sub to where I'm not looking at these comments every day. Like I'm that big to not, you know what I'm saying? Check the comments. Definitely be checking the comments. Y'all let me know about that. Next, put your state's death toll in the comment section. But if it's not over 200, then don't bother. You know what I'm saying, dude, bro, Alabama. Put your state's death toll in the comment section only if it's over 200, right? I was, I think I heard that boy. Shout out that boy Tim Snow over there at Texas Prison Stories. Been watching that boy, another one since he started. I think I heard him say last week that in this year, this year, last year, right, that there's been like 10 deaths in in big ass Texas. The state of Texas, big. Don't mess with Texas. Y'all, y'all only got 10 deaths. That's crazy and messed up for me to be boasting about. Like, we're known for two things, right? College football and the worst prison system in the United States. Can't be from around here. Catch up. Watch out. What's the what, last one? So, with all the talk of rallies, hunger strikes, sewing circles and circle jerks i thought i'd highlight a time where inmates in the alabama department of corrections banded together and chose violence so without further ado i present to y'all the siege of st Clair. april 15 1985 i was sitting on the couch in my birmingham home watching television my wife, Catherine, and I were waiting to go to an afternoon movie. I was a Tuesday through Saturday shifter at that time. My wife was a UAB nursing student with no Monday afternoon classes, so Monday matinees were our ritual. Then the phone rang. Bring. It was about 2 p.m. It was my editor, Randy Henderson, at the Birmingham News. Quote, did you hear about the prison riot? Unquote, Henderson asked. Quote, uh, no, I said, quote, where? Quote, St. Clair, he said. Big story, I thought, envisioning an all-hands-on-deck scenario for news coverage. I guess you want me to come in, I said. Well, not actually, Henderson said. The inmates want you to come in. They've asked for you by name. The highway to prison. Next thing I knew... I was in my little Toyota headed to Springville to meet the Department of Public Safety Lieutenant Roy Smith. We met on the side of the road at our spot not far from St. Clair Correctional Facility. Going to meet with the state trooper, I'm sure I drove over the speed limit. Questions filled my head. Why did the inmates ask for me? A year earlier, I took a tour of St. Clair at the invitation of the prison's warden, Larry Spears. Now Spears was a hostage and had been hit up badly. My brain was in overdrive. Will I be allowed to speak with the officers and inmates? How do I cover this as a journalist? I was planning on taking pictures with the camera and handwriting notes. Would I get the chance to call in information to my editor Henderson from a prison phone? What if they take me hostage? Consumed with these thoughts, I jumped into Lieutenant Smith's car and left mine on the side of the road. We got to the prison at about 3.30 p.m., seven hours into the siege. Dozens of reporters, news vans, and photographers waited outside the gate, all there to cover the story like me, a story for which I'd soon have a ringside seat. Ringside at the riot. Smith told me to get down on the floorboard of the car and cover up with the coat so the slew of reporters couldn't see me. I joked about sparking a second riot if the reporter saw me going into the prison. Lieutenant Smith was not amused and didn't laugh as we creeped through the gate. Inside, we would find dozens of inmate snitches and officers had been hit up. In addition to the warden, who had his jaw broken, before his jaw shattered climbing up the Lord's ladder, 21 others were being held hostage. A female social worker had been, quote, taken advantage of by prisoners. One officer had lost an eyeball. We sat in the car, my head down for more than an hour, 
About 5.45 p.m., the Alabama Department of Corrections spokesman John Hale ran over and said, quote, We need you quick. I grabbed my camera and notebook and ran into the prison. Entering another world. We walked down a dark gray tunnel-like hallway, which was soaking wet because fires set by prisoners had tripped the sprinklers. In that tunnel, which seemed to be a main route from inside the prison to the outside, there were prisoners on stretchers, some hit up, some having overdosed on narcotics taken from the prison infirmary broken into by them. IV Demerol, a narcotic, and phenobarbital, or barbiturate, were the drugs of choice. I was led into the visitation area in B building through a sliding bulletproof glass door protected by armed officers. More than 25 inmates could be seen outdoors in the courtyard. In all, officials estimated about 200 inmates in the 900-man facility actively participated in the riot. Water was an inch deep on the floor of the visiting area where inmates usually met with their families and friends. FBI negotiators and prison administration were conversing in small groups while armed officers stood in various spots of the large cafeteria-like room. This was the site of negotiations. Outside, some 500 to 600 state and local law enforcement officers surrounded the prison. Heated Negotiations Three prisoners were quickly led into the visitor section, patted down, and sat at a table. Kenneth Satch Henley did the talking. Food is slop, Henley said. The prison is trying to lower the cost of each inmate by denying food. A video camera was recording negotiations. I took notes and pictures. The prisoners had a long list of grievances and demands from the reasonable, such as being allowed to grow longer hair, to the highly unlikely, such as firing of all the parole board members. <laughs> Prisoner James White spoke for black inmates. He said he had been in Alabama system 28 years now, and quote, 28 years ago, the conditions were way better than it is now, unquote. Sidney Bird, a young slim man with a swastika tattoo on his hand, said hostages will not be released until the public has heard us. In and out of juvenile and adult institutions since age 14, Bird told prison officials more than 100 prisoners took active roles in the rebellion. Bird told me, quote, This is the first riot this unit has ever seen, and ain't nobody ratted it off. It's been brewing. Everybody in this prison has been waiting for this to happen, Bird said. You don't see blacks and whites fighting out there. We're all in this together. Now, I want to pause real quick and speak on the divide with prisoners today. You see these folks came together, you know what I'm saying, and not for no BS. These folks, black and white prisoners, came together. As y'all can see the picture I probably got in there now, like... I don't know why there's only one black dude out there, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if they'd be ill representative of the numbers. I think that was the start of, like, the crack laws and stuff like that back then. But you see what they saying? They not playing with y'all. And I, the warden jaw broke, folks hit up, snitches, clawed, have mercy. Months later, I would interview Bird while he was in isolation at Found Correctional Facility. He was segregated because he had been labeled a snitch. He opened up to investigators and told them everything he knew about prisoners' drug use, how a pistol had been smuggled in the prison, and the implication of others. The riot is the most talked about thing in the system, Bird said, and all the other inmates say is, quote, that's the dude that ratted it off. When the inmates left to go back into the unsecured side of the prison, through the sliding door, negotiators seemed more optimistic. At that door... I had heard my name being called. Mike! Mike! It was Cecil Dwight Watts calling me over. A year or so earlier, I had written a piece about Watts as one of the kingpins of the prescription drug rings in the Birmingham area. Quote, he once got on the phone and had work delivered to his prison cell, said a detective. He knew the lingo of both cops and doctors, which helped him in his journey to obtain prescription drugs. He could talk you out your shoes, the detective said. 
He was serving more than a dozen years as an habitual drug offender. Watts said some of the inmates knew of my news stories and about prisons and prisoners, and that's how my name came up as the reporter to contact. Watts was standing in the unsecured side of the facility, an open, dark courtyard where I could see several fires set by prisoners. There were no troopers with rifles on this side. The only officers were hostages. I was standing about two feet away. He waved me in. Come on back here. I'll show you around. He held the door open for me. Now, Cecil was a persuasive guy, assuring me unlimited access, interviews, and photos. My journalistic instincts were intrigued, but I didn't budge. In a few seconds, I had a raging battle within myself. My head said no, but my body screamed go. My head down. To this day, I wonder what would have happened if I chose to ball him in. Nah, you were supposed to do that, bro. You were supposed to go on off up in there. They hit me back a couple months and said, we need you to go in the Donaldson, D.C. That boy Daryl Shaw got a strap. I'd been right up in there. I'd be entering an arena where inmates still had control with the smuggled in gun, baseball bats, broom handles, and sharpened instruments, among other things later confiscated by officers. The gun, an inmate later told me, was a 38 caliber over and under two barrel Derringer, and had been smuggled into the prison and been there for several weeks before the riot. See, we been had them straps in there. We been had them straps in there. Dale Shaw in the intro with the strap at the end. We been had them straps in there. It had been buried on the prison rec yard for safekeeping. Rumors of a second gun were not confirmed. Quote, nah, man, I've got to cover the negotiations, I told Watts. The negotiations were ongoing. It was about 7 p.m., nine hours into the siege. So two hours had passed. Quote, look, we danced around this all day and we finally struck a bargain and now you're backing out. An FBI agent said to the inmate negotiators in a rising voice. Satch Henley was still the chief hostage negotiator for the inmates. Quote, all we're doing is trying to resolve this thing and bring the rest of them in. Henley said in an uncharacteristically tired voice. We're trying to unwind. There's some people with limited intelligence and limited schooling back there who want an agreement in writing, even though I know it ain't worth the shit. Darkness falls. State Prison Commissioner Freddie Smith had arrived on the scene from Montgomery. As we started approaching darkness, I made the decision we would not go all night, as other states have, and go into days and days of negotiations, Smith said. At this point, the main demand Henley was trying to get was a promise that no physical harm would come to any of the prisoners. Smith signed a statement making that promise. About 7.10 p.m., two female hostages were released. They appeared distressed. By 8 p.m., all the hostages had been released. The warden strolled through the door, calmly shaking hands along the way, his jaw swollen, which prevented conversation. <laughs> He's, his, this later would have to be wired shut. A broken, what did that say? Pilates? Pal Lord. And missing teeth. Shit. Fuck the warden up. My chair. Aftermath. Quote, We've litigated these prison conditions for almost 10 years in the federal courts, and the state officials have resisted the federal government for 10 years, said Henley. Now, pause see just like alabama's resisted the feds now with the investigation not giving them it now they didn't now the federal government is suing us and the state of alabama still is dug the freak in paying lawyers tens of millions of dollars to fight the united states of let me continue quote here they have built a good prison but they make it into a hellhole but was it a good prison in the aftermath a lot of attention was directed at the design of St. Clair and how it was easy for inmates to take it over. Bird said the siege was easy, referring to the prison as a glass house. Quote, you can go anywhere inside it just by busting glass, Bird said. False ceilings allowed prisoners to reach other areas like the pharmacy and access drugs. The prisoners did an estimated $1.5 million in damage and the rebuilding addressed these and other design flaws. 
In a letter dated May 31st, 1985, prisoner Ronald Monk Kennedy lamented the lack of attention to the inmate grievances. A long list of demands was handed by the inmate group to prison officials. The Birmingham News later obtained the list. Looking back at it now, and it appears to be a laundry list ranging from the trivial and absurd mixed in with honest, legitimate gripes. The Department of Corrections didn't release the inmates' demands, and its officials expressed their displeasure when I obtained it and printed it. Demands included shoes of choice, Polaroid cameras and film, Coke and sandwich machines in the breezeway, allowed personal typewriters, one unit all black, one unit all white, and the others mixed. Pause. I wonder who asked for that. <laughs> Uh, limit cave lock segregations to 14 days total cave lock segregations old heads get in the comment section and let me know what that means i guess that just means you know a trip to segregation a complete law library with typewriters and free legal assistance and so on it probably didn't help the inmates cause that a demand for long hair and beards topped the 30 item list Deputy Warden James DeLoach said shortly after the riot, quote, A friend of mine, Mike Shavers, lost a nine for what? Longer hair and beards? Pause, smart ass mother. You know this wasn't about beard. He lost a nine because of the conditions. Y'all treat motherfuckers effed up and stuff like that. You know what's going on. But Kennedy said the long hair and beards demand was blown out of proportion and used as a smokescreen to dismiss prisoner demands as trivial. Same thing that happened with this hunger strike a couple years back. The one thing that is certain, prisoner and prison officials agree, is that the St. Clair riot did little to change the day-to-day -day quality of life for prisoners in Alabama prisons. Conditions didn't get any better. Today in 2023, their hair is longer, Security is tighter. About 20 prisoners were indicted on charges, including attempted unaliving, kidnapping, and assault. It seems like nothing was accomplished, Henley wrote in a letter to me after the riot. Expect a lot of inmates are going to get a lot of time. Hell continued. Over the decades since, violence has continued at a high rate at St. Clair and almost every other Alabama prison. On April 17, 2015, 12 inmates were treated by correctional and medical staff following a riot at St. Clair, and three others were treated in off-site medical facilities. Stabbings have been frequent pretty much weekly. In the last couple years, an inmate was stabbed to death and two guards were stabbed in separate incidents at St. Clair. A guard was stabbed to death years ago at Holman Correctional Facility. And a couple years ago, the United States Department of Justice launched an investigation and eventual lawsuit over violence, takings, overcrowding, and other problems within the Alabama men's prison. That night, 35 years ago, I prepared to leave St. Clair Correctional Facility. I had a story to tell. Bill King one of the inmate negotiators grabbed my arm. Quote, Hey, check on us, will you? I told him I'd probably be following up on the situation. Squeezing my arm tighter, he leaned in and said, Not the situation, man. I mean us, personally. Man, and there y'all have it, man. The siege of St. Clair is tough, man. You know, the hunger strikes, riots. Me, personally, I would rather y'all make them really feel you like these prisoners did right here than sit there and starve yourselves and do nothing and hope for change. You know what I'm saying? Kumbaya. I'd rather you really make them feel you. But we don't abdicate for, you know, violence over here at Alabama prisoner profiles. But, um... <laughs> DC uh, would want you to make them feel you rather than lay down. DC the voice, Alabama prisoner profiles.